In this problem, we'll be drawing a sketch of the graph of a quadratic function, h of x equals x squared plus 5. We'll be identifying the characteristics of the graph, including the vertical intercept, the vertex, the axis of symmetry, and the horizontal intercepts. We'll also be finding the domain and the range of the function. Let's start with the vertical intercept. So the vertical axis is the one that goes up and down, and I want to know where the graph crosses that axis. So wherever that point is, what I do know is that the input would be 0. I just don't know what the output is yet. To find that out, I'll take the equation given to me and simply replace x with 0. 0 squared is 0, and 0 plus 5 is 5. And as always, with the quadratic, the vertical intercept is always the value of c, the constant. And it was given to be 5, originally in the problem here. Given a quadratic function, if you want to find the vertical intercept, you always just identify what the constant is at the end. You may have known from the beginning that the vertical intercept was 0, 5, given that 5 is the constant in the equation. So now I know the vertical intercept is the point 0, 5, and its point would say be right here. Now for the vertex, the formula for the vertex of a parabola, or at least the x value of the vertex anyway, is the opposite of b divided by 2a. And then once you find that number, you can find the y value of the vertex by simply plugging that number into the function. And in this case, the function's name is h. So whatever negative b over 2a comes out to be, I'll take that number, and that'll be the input into my function to get the y value of the vertex. So the first thing to do is to identify the value of a and b. My function is 1x squared plus, now I don't see a term with just the variable x, so the linear term is missing. What this means is I can think of b as being the value 0, which makes sense because 0 times x would be 0, and you would not need to write that term, and we didn't. And then, of course, we've already stated that the constant term is 5. So this is just a fancy way of writing y equals x squared plus 5, the given equation. And that means that a is 1 and b is 0. So the x value of the vertex would be the opposite of b, and b is 0, divided by 2 times a, and a is 1. Well, it turns out that 0 divided by any number is 0, and the opposite of 0 is actually still 0. So the x value of my vertex is 0, and we've already have in the graph that when you plug 0 into the function, you get out 5. So this is a special case in which the vertical intercept of the graph is also the vertex of the parabola. I can already get an idea what my graph is going to look like by identifying the value of a. A moment ago, we noticed that a is 1. Since there's no coefficient written in front of the x squared, it's assumed to be a 1. And the fact that a is positive doesn't really matter that it's a 1. The fact that it's positive means that my graph is going to open up. It's going to be a parabola that opens up and resemble the letter u, which means it's going to have a vertex, which is a minimum, or it'll be the lowest point in the graph. So if I was to move this general picture over to where my graph is, you would see the graph must look something like this. So notice that the graph starts above the horizontal axis here, and it opens up. So if 0, 0,5 is the smallest point on the graph, and it's above the horizontal axis, this means the graph is never going to cross the horizontal axis. So this is a case where there are no horizontal intercepts. So I'm just going to write none, or if D and E, for the fact that the horizontal intercepts do not exist. The axis of symmetry is always the vertical line that passes through the vertex. And I feel the need to move this down a little bit before I draw my axis of symmetry. And I'm trying to draw the axis of symmetry is a vertical line that passes through the vertex. So that's not perfect, but it'll do. And the equation of a vertical line is always x equals the number that it passes through on the horizontal axis, which in our case would be 0. You also could use the x value here on the vertex as a guide. So as long as you realize that x equals 0 is the equation of a line, so this green vertical line that I've drawn is called the axis of symmetry because the curvature of the graph to the left of the axis of symmetry is supposed to exactly match the curvature to the right. It should be a mirror image of each other. Sometimes I explain this to students by saying if you had a piece of paper and you had finger paint back from kindergarten and you put this figure on the paper in paint and then you folded the piece of paper about this dotted line, what would happen is that the paint to the left of that line would be smudged over to the right giving you basically an exact copy, but a mirror image. That's what an axis of symmetry is supposed to represent. So let me record that over here. The axis of symmetry would be the line 
x equals 0. And at this point, you may want to verify your results with the graphing calculator. So I'm going to press y equals, type my equation in, x squared plus 5. Just so students are in the same window as me, the quickest way to get students to have the calculator the same window as me is just to press zoom 6, so we all start in a standard window which is negative 10 to 10 in both the x and y direction. And what you see is pretty much the same thing I got with my hand sketch. In fact, if I press the trace button, notice the calculator tends to start on the standard window by tracing starting at x equals 0. So already we see that 0 comma 5 is the vertical intercept. Now this doesn't guarantee that it's the vertex. Just because it looks like that's the lowest point in the graph doesn't mean that it really is. What tells me that that's the lowest point was the fact that I used the formula negative b over 2a for the x value of the vertex, which came out to be x equals 0. So now let's talk about the domain and the range of the function. The domain basically is supposed to be a list of all of the x values that you can plug into the function and actually get a value out. This is always difficult for me to explain to students with a quadratic because nothing ever can go wrong. So the domain basically just says you can plug in anything that you want, and the function will always give you a real number output. So for example, my equation is h of x equals x squared plus 5. So the point is, no matter what number you make up, I'm just clicking random numbers, you'll always be able to square that number and get a real number answer. And then no matter what that number is, why wouldn't you be able to add 5? That'll change the number, but it doesn't change the fact that it's still a real number. So basically, any real number can be multiplied by itself, so it can be squared, and it'll give you another real number, and any real number can be added to 5, giving you another real number. So every x value will work. So one way to represent that all real numbers will work for the x values is to list them all, like 0 works, 1 works, 2 works. So you can put a dot on the real number line representing all the numbers that work. But what you have to realize is that whole numbers aren't the only numbers on the real number line. In fact, there's infinitely many numbers on the real number line, like 1.5 would work. In fact, a minute ago, I made up 8.2574. So if you took the time to plot dots on every single x value that works, even if you were to zoom in, you would eventually see that everything on the real axis would have a dot. And this is why sometimes teachers have students shade the answers that work. And basically, you'd be shading everything to the left forever, which represents the negative direction. We call left forever negative infinity. You'd also be shading to the right forever, including everything, 1, 1.1, 1.056, every number you could possibly think of. And those numbers grow without bound, but positives, we call that direction to the right, positive infinity. So for the domain, we say that there's no limit how far to the left you can go, that's negative infinity, and there's no limit to how far right you can go. You're going to keep finding numbers that work for this function. And since infinity is not a real value, we put parentheses so that we're not including it. Including it would mean that you can somehow plug in infinity into the equation, and it turns out that that's just nonsense. So we don't actually include infinity. In fact, please erase from your brain that you ever saw what I just wrote, and don't tell any of my colleagues that I wrote it. So that leaves us with finding the range of the graph. There's actually something to talk about there. Let me quickly delete this garbage that does not pass for mathematics, and go back to the graph and point out that the range would be the set of all outputs that you could possibly get. So imagine we had a thousand years to sit and make up random numbers, square them and add five, and see what kind of things come out of this function. And we wrote them down. Hurry up, write down 32.19. And we kept doing this forever and ever and ever. What you'd eventually notice is that you pretty much can get almost any number in the world, but what you would notice is that all those numbers are always bigger than or equal to five. And that's what the graph really helps show is that there's a limit to how small the y values get, and that's what this lowest point meant. The fact that the lowest point on the graph was 0, 5 here means that you'll never get a y value smaller than 5, no matter what random number you try to plug in. If you don't believe me, you can spend the next thousand years plugging in random numbers into the function, and you'll see that 5 is pretty much the smallest you'll ever get. So for the range of my function, I need to tell people that in terms of the numbers in the y-axis, 5 is the smallest value that you get, but you do get it. I'm going to put a bracket here. Because you actually do get that y value out. If you were to, in those thousands of years that you spend plugging random numbers, ever hit on the number 0. Plugging 0 in the function does actually give you out 5. So since that's a value that the function actually takes on, we will include it with a bracket here. Then we always put the largest number, and sometimes students get this backwards with interval notation. It's always smallest, comma, largest number. 
and the largest number really is no limit. In fact, all you have to do to produce larger outputs is to plug in larger inputs. If you want a large output, just plug in a really big X value and you'll be sure to get a really big Y value out. And the bigger the X value you plug in, the bigger the Y value. That's why the graph is drawn with these arrows to indicate that there's no limit to how high the graph goes. It's just going to keep increasing forever. And if you had the patience on the graph, if you press trace and trace to the right, you'd actually see the Y values getting bigger and bigger and this would never end. You could hold the red arrow button down for a thousand years and the Y values are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And since they're all positive, we call that direction positive infinity. So if a graph is going up forever, that means that the Y values are growing without bound in the direction of positive infinity. So we put an infinity here. And once more, we'll put a parenthesis there to indicate that you actually can't get out infinity. There is no number in the world I can make up and square it and add 5 to get infinity on my calculator. There's no limit to how big the number gets, but infinity itself is not a number. Okay, so all of that was probably way more than you bargained for. So as always, I hope this makes sense, and I wish you the best of luck.